Big applaud, Mr. Jim Rowan. <laughs> Thank you. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Hi there. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. We would like to have you here. Well, that's quite a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way we we actually behave here. That happens every day when I go in the office. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see you and welcome. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for the invite. I'm mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm glad to be here and meet the um, the west of uh, Sweden contingency. I guess exactly. It's not yeah. so hard to understand so far. No, you're no, right. No, you're right. That's good. We were a little bit afraid, actually. Uh, oh, well, yeah. Tom Johnson. Yeah, the Scottish uh, he, accent. Yeah. yeah, he coached me. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> and you know it's that. Swinglish, you call it, right? Mm, <laughs> that's right. And the, the former CEO of uh, Volvo Group, Mr. Leif Johansson, he said that uh, the second most uh, used language here in Gothenburg is bad English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have bad English. So we, also, we so. have to try that. So, welcome. Um, you're pretty new. Two months. Yep. How do you feel after? Two months, and, and uh, what's your impression of, of uh, West Sweden so Great. far? Well, I start maybe with West Sweden. That's that's probably the, the the easier part of the question. I'm from Glasgow, and so the west of Scotland and the west of Sweden are very very similar, uh, and climate and topology. You know, I'm an islander, so I like the sea, um, and I'm probably I'm probably one of the few people that work for Volvo that comes from a town that rains more than Gothenburg. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that basis, I feel very much at home. Mm. Uh, but, but seriously, if you look at Gothenburg, and it, it's a harbour town, Glasgow is a harbour town, it was born on shipbuilding, and then of course the shipbuilding disappeared quite quickly. And both Gothenburg <coughs> and Glasgow both had to reinvent themselves, um, and they had to really pull themselves up and use technology, keep that work ethic and and, and industrial spirit and, and, and re yet rebuild itself with technology to be successful again. And you see that here in Gothenburg and, and you know, I'm glad to see we see the same. I'm going to move this. I'm glad to see we see the same in, in, um, in Glasgow as well. And it's got, you know, there's this thing, I'm sure there, I'm sure there probably is, I've picked up by now, that there's this thing between Gothenburg and Stockholm. There's the same thing between Glasgow and Edinburgh, right? And, and, and Glasgow has always been the underdog and uh, and so you get that little bit of underdog spirit as well. There's a bit of grit. There's a bit of dirt under the fingernails. People have got their sleeves rolled up, and and the and that you know um, spirit and that kind of feeling of industrialness and good work good work ethic is I, I feel very much okay. is here in, in in Gothenburg as well. Have you had time to to get around? In yeah, in I play tennis just over Ullevi, is it? Yeah, next to okay. here. So, and then, yeah, I tend to run in the morning stuff. I have, a t I have an apartment in the middle of town. Okay, so. have you been up to the archipelago? I have. Now, I'm going to apologise for my pronunciation, so I'll, but I will have a go. Uh, so, I've been up to Schmogen. Yeah, okay. Schmogen. Yeah, Schmogen. And next time I go up, I will head to a place called, and this is going to challenge me for sure, Fischgebaskil. Oh, <laughs> close enough. Yeah, close enough. We have to practice. Very good. A bit more, maybe. Very yeah. good. I mean, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's my next. Uh, well, there you go. So. Great. Ha have you found any favorite places so far? I mean, just a few weeks. But where where do you would, would like to go when you you not work? Here in uh, in, in Gothenburg yep. itself. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great town just to walk around. It's a nice. You know, you got. I like the district up at Haga. Up, up here, and so mm -hmm. just but basically just walking around the city and okay. stopping, having a beer, glass of wine. I know that you are a fan of football mm -hmm. a lot, and uh, if uh, EFK Gothenburg or EFK Göteborg or Blue White, as we say here in Gothenburg, yeah. should play against uh, Partick Thistle, yeah, what would be the result? Oh, Thistle would win for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, but <laughs> I may be living in Gothenburg, but Thistle is my hometown. Uh, yeah, or Glasgow's my hometown, and this was my home, my home club. So, would you would you like to say something about that club? <laughs> so, those people who know Glasgow, Glasgow separates around the, the the football clubs, the big club, Glasgow Rangers and Glasgow Celtic. There's some people who are nodding, and other people who think I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, but it separates actually quite 
from history as separated around sectarian grounds. So generally speaking, people who supported Celtic were Catholic and people who supported Rangers were Protestant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't want to get in the middle of that debate, so I chose Partick Thistle <laughs> as a neutral club. But it's from the lower divisions, so the football's not quite as um, skillful. Okay. But it was very homely and smaller ground. And when you were young, their marketing strategy was that they allowed people less than 12 to go for free on the understanding that you would be then a, 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 you know, a fan and when you got older you would actually pay. And, and with me that worked. So I went in when I was young, I watched for free until I was 12 and then... You mm -hmm. know, there used to be a bar and below that bar you could go <laughs> uh, and for a while I used to duck in but eventually I had to pay. So yeah, that's my, uh, that's my soccer. Uh, Wonderful. Um, so far, have you found any difference in, in mentality in between Swedes and Scots? You're far more patient at queuing okay. uh. than, than the Scots. You, I, I, it's almost like you enjoy the process. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but very well behaved in queues. And I'm, I'm looking at my watch and everybody seems to be very relaxed. So it's about the only, uh, it's about the only difference I see so far. Okay. Early days, though. You will see. We are strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim, before starting the process becoming a CEO of Volvo Cars, what was your perception of the company? Well, I mean, Volvo, I think sometimes as well, when you come from a country where you have such an icon of industry, you, it becomes natural, yeah. right? That, um, but And you, f you think maybe this is just a Swedish thing. But in actual fact, Volvo, I think, has had, that's one of the reasons that I, that I joined the company. Well, Volvo has been revered as a brand which stood for integrity, trust, of course, safety, mm. humility. And in a, in a kind of strange way, the world has moved towards the attributes of Volvo, the culture, let's say, of Volvo. Uh, that's, where, that's where the world has moved to. It used to be when I was a young man, Everybody wanted to drive a BMW and you know be kind of boy racer, and that showed that you were being successful in life and stuff. And I was amazed recently. I was in London, and I was at the the Google campus mm -hmm. where you have a lot of young professional people who are earning decent salaries and so on, and very progressive in their outlook. Ten years ago, that car park would have been filled of those BMWs and so on. And I was astonished and obviously delighted by the amount of Volvos that I, that were in that car park. And that was a real stark, you know, there in front of you, you could say, wow. And I was, I, was actually, I was on a call, and as I was walking around the car park, I'm thinking, there's a lot of Volvos here, <laughs> which is great. And I think our, our brand, our, our, our brand promise, our culture of the company it has got that trust within the organization, within the world, not just within Sweden. Yeah. And so, so that was one reason for joining, which is just the brand and the brand, the brand strength. And then... The other reason is we're in this massive transformation mm. right now as an industry. One is technological, as we move towards electrical <coughs> propulsion and core compute technology and uh, co connectivity and so on. And then the other side, you've got this other massive transformation that's happened simultaneously, which is really about uh, the e-commerce transformation and how we build, how Volvo builds an e-commerce engine and a digital backbone that can connect directly mm. with the customer. Mm. And then, of course, the whole thing is underpinned by sustainability. We've said... We will be a carbon-free uh, company by 2030. We will only sell um, um, BEV products, electric, electric battery products by that. N no one else really from the industry has been brave enough to say that. Mm. So no credit to that. that. That was before my time. So I'm happy to pick up that and, and realise that vision. But credit to the management team that came before me that had the bravery to say, no, nope, we're going we're gonna to put a line in the sand. We're going to be 100% electric by 2030. And will we be halfway there by 2025? Mm. And I just finished a whole bunch of meeting with analysts, and that clarity of purpose and that that that, that courageous step, just as we were becoming a public company, lands extremely well with mm -hmm. with, with the analyst community. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. So those are the three reasons: great brand, massive transformation, which is incredibly interesting, and then of course the sustainability and the mm. and the purpose. And I think as well, I'm. You know, I'm part of the generation, as many of you people are here today, you know, we're part of the generation that caused some of this fossil fuel imbalance within within the world. 
it's nice to be able to be working for a company like Volvo who's saying, like, we, we're actually getting, we have the engineering talent and we have the, the, the fortitude mm -hmm. and the energy to go and try and change that and make global mobility carbon free for the future. Um, and that's just, that's insp for me, that's inspiring to be, to be part of, especially as you get to the back end of your career and you think that'd be a nice way to kind of finish. Mm. So those are the three reasons. Great. What in your background is the biggest issue that you can bring to Volvo now? Um, I, I think m in terms of the, so I come from the high tech industry mm -hmm. and we have tons of people and I get asked that question, oh, you don't come from the automotive industry. Actually, some people say you're not a car guy. I'm like, hang on a second, just because I don't come from the automotive company doesn't mean to say I'm not a car guy, you know, that that you can have a deep interest in, in, in cars and automotive, even if you've not worked in the industry. But it's true that I'm not from that industry, but we have 42,000 people in the company. The vast majority of those people are fantastically knowledgeable in automotive. Now we're starting to bring in the skills that we need for the future, which is software and electronics and computer science grads and so on, to bring them in and take us the next part of that journey. Um, and of course, I come from the, the high tech world. So I think that's probably the, the biggest thing that I bring to the company is I look at it slightly differently. I understand core compute technology because, uh, you know, in cell phones or, or in some of the consumer products I, that, that I was involved in, we we built them in. I understand connectivity because obviously cell phones are the are the, uh, the nucleus, I guess, of, of the whole connectivity movement. So I think that's probably mm. the main things that, that I that I can bring to the company. And then there's just there's just that drive and energy to get things done mm. that in the in the consumer electronics industry the cadence is fast. Mm -hmm. If you're making cell phones and you need to and you're competing against Apple and they have the iPhone two, the iPhone three, the iPhone four, the iPhone five, you kinda know they're gonna release an iPhone, what are we at, thirteen now? Probably. The iPhone fourteen's probably gonna be this year and it's probably gonna be September. So you know that's the competition. If you're developing a product, and by the way, 40, 45% of those products sell in the fourth quarter. So they sell up in the run up towards Christmas. If you miss that window, it becomes a big problem. So the cadence of execution mm. in that industry is something which is very, very profound. Mm. Um, and so that sharpness execution, I think, is probably the other, the other thing, hopefully, that mm. you know, we can develop in the company. In your <coughs> first report, uh, it was heading in the right direction, good operation, good figures. Uh, but what about the future? Which challenges do you I see? I can take no credit for the first quarter. I was only <coughs> there for, I think, 11 days. Yeah, but but you thanks, did thanks for that. Um, uh, yeah, it <laughs> was fantastic. Yeah, I managed to <laughs> solve all that in the, in the first 11 days. Um, so the, f the future is pretty clear for us. I mean, mm -hmm. the industry is developing really quickly. Uh, the BEV industry itself, the, the battery electric vehicle industry, is developing quicker than than even the, the hybrid mm. market at this point in time. And so the future for us is to be dominant in that premium sector. Mm. So that's what we've chosen as the sector. So we don't go mass market. We see some, including Tesla's, coming out of the three, the Y, and then sliding down towards the two. So they're they're going more mm. mass market, which is good for us because we're we're fully focused on the on the premium sector. And it's really going to be about those who those companies that can develop a core technology in terms of a core computing technology, battery and battery and electrical propulsion and connectivity, and put all that together in a meaningful offering that that is that is appealing to the the customers. Now, in the past, Volvo con consumers, if you buy a Volvo and you have the money to buy a Volvo, that tended to be an older demographic, partly because of the price. Mm -hmm partly because of the style. The style is now very new and progresses uh, and we're picking up a much younger audience. But then when we offer subscription-based ownership, we drop the year, but we drop the average age by almost 10 years, which is a huge data point because it tells me two things. One, people who really want a product but can't quite afford it will buy the product if we make it easier for them to buy or afford through subscription-based ownership. And then we've got a, a newer, some newer models coming, which are slightly lower in, in price. And that means, perhaps even for the first time, with a, a still a premium product, but at a lower price entry point, with subscription-based ownership, we can reach first-time buyers. So you've got Gen Z coming into the market. So Gen Z 18-year-olds mm -hmm. coming into the market, so they'll be first-time buyers. Mm -hmm. Our 
progressive stance in terms of the styling of the vehicle, the connectivity of the vehicle, but also our brand attributes of humility and sustainability and trust and integrity and, and a nice minimalistic Swedish Scandinavian design mm-hmm. talks to that demographic really well. And then we then we can pick up those 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 young first time buyers, mm-hmm. uh, and that's totally additive to our market because we we've never really managed to reach those people. So now you now we need to take care of them. So if I can bring in a, a young customer, first time buyer, the first car, uh, let's say it's going to be our, our our lowest model, um, and probably the smallest model, and then we can stick with that person as they go through life. So as they get married and have kids and need a bigger car, get a dog, need a second car. Then that's how that's how that that trust is built up um, through the years with, with those customers, and it makes it really sticky mm-hmm. for 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 the uh, for the customer. Make it difficult to leave Volvo as a mm. as a partner. So that's that's where we're, we're we're headed with the company, and so but then we've got to build that digital backbone. Where do those young people shop? Where do they get their information? How do you find them? How do you convert them to customers? How do you keep them happy? Um, and all of that stuff is that is that digital. Um, transformation that we're going through right now on the e-commerce side. Will, will we see car dealers in the future? Of course. And this is the thing, I mean, this is the thing that's that's misrepresented. We have a massive advantage with our dealership that people like Tesla don't have. They don't have that. So we have t- about 2,600 dealers around the world. And those dealers, the collective talent within those dealers is about 66,000 people. So that's 66,000 brand evangelists or brand ambassadors that have been working mm-hmm. for Volvo for a long time. And people will still want to go into dealerships to buy cars, by and large. The younger demographic um, will be more comfortable, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but the, the people who go in, you're, you're making a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 purchase. It's a big purchase, so you want to go test the vehicle, drive it, touch it, look at the, the dealer in the eye, make sure that, that they're going to be around if you have any problems. And what that means is that they will come in, they will look at the car, but rather than order it on the dealer's network and all those different ad- administration layers that we have right now, some people are sending us faxes, some people it's done on Excel, we're going to basically unplug those guys and plug them into Volvo.com. So even if you go to the dealership and you test a vehicle and you think, yeah, I really like this, when you come back into the dealer with the dealer sitting next to you, when they type that in, the order gets placed on Volvo.com. And that's important for us because then we get that direct contact with the customer, and then we can talk to that customer on a regular basis. So that's so. The, but the dealers play a huge part. The younger demographic will be very comfortable buying online. They get their information online. They might go to a dealer. They probably won't. And the way in which they shop is very different. So they shop. They don't trust. They trust their own network. So they build up a, a social network across. You know, from I don't know the age of eight or whatever it is, whenever kids get access to cell phones these days. And they start to build up that network through the various channels. Obviously, it's like WeChat in China or here it's Snap or Instagram or you know WhatsApp mm-hmm. or whatever. And they build up this channel and they say, I'm thinking of buying a car. What do you guys think? And of course, they're going to put that out to a, a network that, that they trust and they've connected with. And they ping that out. Or I'm, think, I'm thinking of buying the XC40. What do you guys think? Boom. That goes out to that network and they'll take that information. Yeah, it's a great car. I've got one. My mum's got one or this, that and the other. They'll make the decision based on that. And they'll do some research online. They'll be very happy going online, especially if you offer them subscription because then they, they, they don't at that point make a $40,000 commitment. They make a three or a six month commitment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's very, very different. Yep. So, and that's the, change in, that's the change in the world that we're in. I think we're way, way ahead of the co- a lot of the competition with the what our progressive thinking towards not just how we how we manufacture cars and and going towards electric, but also going towards how we engage with the with, with the customers. Fantastic! Uh, if it's going to be that way, and uh, sure, you're on the right way. Uh, well, I you can see it right now because if mm-hmm. you look at a company in the UK, we just made an investment yep. in a company called Carwell. So we have a technology fund, and we use that technology fund as a strategic fund rather than a, f- a financial fund. Um, and we made an, an investment in a company called Carwow. Some of you guys may be aware of that. It's a, U, it's, it's a UK company, but it has operations in, uh, outside the UK as well. 13% of every new car sold is sold in Carwow. 28% of every used car sold is sold in Carwow. That's a data point that's really hard to ignore because the, that, that train of digitization and online shopping on everything, as well as cars now, that train's left the station. 
it's gone. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you better hope you had jumped on before I left. So, our dealership now are saying, how can how can we help them mm -hmm. digitize, and how can we help them be part of the next generation of how people actually buy and subscribe to mm -hmm. high purchase products like like Volvo. Now you're talking about I've been talking about many changes in in the car and automotive industry. Yeah. Wh which ones will be the three major areas that the whole industry will change in, in the next coming three five years? Do you think? If you just focus on the three most important. Yeah, so the the biggest change will be towards, well, let's call te technology. The three things will be battery, uh, electric propulsion. So that's yep. going to be the battery, the electric motor, the inverter, and the and the software battery management system. But let's just grip that together and call it electrical propulsion. The other one is core compute and core compute technology, uh, and the third one is connectivity. So that it's constantly connected up and down to the cloud. It connects to your iPhone. You have a phone which is your digital key. So when you walk up to the to the to the door, if, even if you're an Android and I'm an Apple user, when I walk up, it recognizes it's me, and the dashboard puts up my okay. Apple or your Google if you're mm. on Google. Mm. You prefer that. Mm. Mm. So those are so connectivity, electrical propulsion, and core compute technology. That's the big technology mm -hmm. drivers. And then of course on the other side, you've got that direct that direct connection to the customer and how mm -hmm. you sell on how you build that digital backbone. Okay. There are many new players on the market right now. I mean, you mentioned uh, Apple, Tesla, and so on. Yeah. Which is the advance to be, uh, an, so, so so to say, traditional manufacturer in the automotive? And, and Tesla's not new any longer. I mean, Tesla, I don't know how old Tesla is now, 12, 15 years, something like yeah, that. Okay. So they actually count them as, they got first mover advantage, and mm -hmm. they did a lot of good things for the industry. And, you know, I, I think you need to applaud that you know, that courageousness and, and, and that foresightedness of Tesla. Of the rest of the pack, of the, of the, let's call it the traditional automakers that are moving in that direction, the big benefit you have, it's difficult for a, a startup startup. So I think it's very difficult for someone like Lucid, a startup, or even Rivian, who are two of the, 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 the born electric startups, because they don't have all the infrastructure that we have. We have, whether you have an electric car or a, or a, or a nice car, an internal combustion car, you still need paint shops, you still need factories, you still need the supply chain, you still need great people, you still need designers. We have all of that. Mm. And therefore, I think we can compete much more uh, aggressively and much more, um, at a much higher performance than some of the startups. And, but you need to have, you need to have that clarity of purpose when I talk to the investment community, what they, one of the things they really like it that, is that we've been courageous to say, we are going to be an electric car company by 2030. We're going to be halfway there by 25. There's no ifs, muts, or, or buts, or maybes in that. That's where we're headed. We burnt that bridge behind us, and the only way forward now for us to success is to, is to execute on that. So we don't have, you know, I see some of our competitors saying, oh, I've got this brand new car, and you can buy it with a V8 cylinder engine that's a confused landscape for me for us at volvo we know exactly where we're headed and that means we can rally our forty-two thousand people our sixty-six thousand dealers every investment decision that we make every hiring decision that we make the just the style and the design of the car is all geared towards being the best electric car manufacturer premium electric car manufacturer in the world. and we don't get distracted by anything on either side of that so one we've got all of the infrastructure, the people, the the factories, the the paint shops, all of that, but we also have a very very clear clarity of purpose, and um, I think people appreciate that. Mm. I'm sure a lot of us are very interesting to hear. What are the advantages by having the uh, he head office in Gothenburg and the manufacturing actually in Sweden? What's up now? What you are saying? A lot of people here are from Gothenburg. But we don't just have the manufacturing suite. That's we the, that, do that, know that, that. but the, you know <laughs> some of it. So, so you give us the positive. <laughs> but the, pos the really the positive is, is the, the world has changed and the whole supply chain. So by us actually having manufacturing in China and Europe, both in Sweden and, mm. and in, in Brussels and um, Belgium, and also having the manufacturing in the US, you eliminate. If you if you build a car now in China and you want to ship that car from China to the US, it's twenty seven and a half percent tax. That makes that takes out most of the profitability. So being able to manufacture Europe's our biggest market. Mm -hmm. So being able to manufacture in Sweden, um, for the whole world. But but yeah. but you know, let's see if you can uh, build where you sell and source where you build. That analogy 
now more than ever is, mm. is really important. So it's great that we have a global network of factories ac across the world. Back to the Sweden mm. part that you say, it's really, there's very few companies that get to be 100 years old. Mm. And the fact that we're on the Toshlander site coming up on a 100 year old, mm -hmm. or 100 year old anniversary, n not me personally, but the company. <laughs> uh, and the 14th of April, 2027, I think is the actual date. So that is a massive data point for us to be, and my job is to try and make sure that we were around for another 100 years. I'll be gone by then, but to lay the foundations yeah. now. So what people have done to keep the company, of course it's going through the peaks mm -hmm. and troughs mm -hmm. like any company of our age. But we're stronger now, I think, than ever before. And mm. part of that is because we're kept to that heritage of what, what we believe in, the values and the culture of the company. Mm. And, of course, that's steeped in, in the mm. Swedish culture itself. So mm. so Sweden plays a massive part in th that North Star for who we stand for and not, not get distracted by by the fads and the, and the fashions of today. We, we've kind of always known our own purpose and as I say, the kind of world's moved towards us a little bit. So, um, so that that's the that's the big part, as well as obviously the great people and stuff that we have here and, and the design centres. Mm. And mm. it's more of a cultural or more of a kind of spiritual, cultural beacon that mm. that that that, that, that uh, I think is embedded within the DNA of the company. Yeah, and and describe what is the culture? What is the Volvo car culture? God, try to describe culture as uh, uh, culture is one of these things that you you either feel it or you mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like when you meet people. Like you know, there's there's certain people, and you say, "Oh, these two people should go on together. They should fall in love because they come from the same background and they would make lovely kids together." And it doesn't work like that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you 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 there's something that you get when you immerse yourself in a culture, mm -hmm. and it's really difficult to say because I can look on paper. You know, I think I'd like to go work for this company, but then I go in. Yeah. And I, and you think this, you know, I can't be my authentic self. I don't think I, I don't think I can thrive in this environment. It's not that they're a bad company mm -hmm. or that you're a bad person. It? It's just you know, don't you, fit in or, you, yeah. you know, you've got to align with your own, uh, your own, um, I guess, belief systems and stuff like that. Mm. So I think that what Volvo has and why it attracts such such talent is that because we kind of know what we stand for, yeah, right. And that is about it, it's not about aggression. It's about humility. What, what is that? What do you call it? Langham? What's the? Logum. 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 So yeah. yeah, I'm learning some of yeah. the Swedish at least, right? <laughs> Good word. But but even that doesn't describe it. This is more for me. It's more coming in from uh, actually. I think the Scottish culture is very similar. We're yeah. kind of a little bit, you know, humble. We we don't. We're not boastful in, in terms of, you know, how we can do this. And there's other nationalities around the world that are a bit like that. Yeah, yep. some of I'm them, not, yeah. I'm not, I don't say that's right or wrong. I'm just, no. but there is. And I don't fit as well into those um, nationalities because, and I think, so the people that we attract and the people, and because of that culture and because we attract those kind of people, those kind of people fit into the company really well and give and can give their best to the company, mm. which then, of course, drives the company on. Mm. And so it's a very collaborative kind of culture. It's a it's a listening culture. It's challenging to some extent, um, mm -hmm. um, but but it's done in a kind of respectful way. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that, generally speaking, that gets the best out of people. So, mm -hmm. but very difficult to describe culture. It's like, what's the culture of your home? Yeah, that's a good you know, question as well. And so, yeah, uh, and, yeah. You, and you say, I, I would like to know that actually. <laughs> yeah, I should tell you later. <laughs> Jim, uh, you have told us you have an objective to reach 100% is fully electric cars to 2030. Uh, I can, um, I have a question. Are you concerned that the infrastructure for electricity is actually lagging behind a little bit? Yeah, so that's one yeah. of the things which, there's, there's certain things. There's, as I see it, there's basically f five, maybe even six, what I call friction factors for full-scale mm. BEV mm. adoption. Three of those we, uh, three of those we need to fix, and then there's three that we need a little bit of help on. Mm. So the three that we need to fix is the cost of batteries, which we're working on. So we made a big investment with Northvolt, so we understand battery, battery technology, and how we can manufacture and design that with with less lithium or less cobalt or less of those met metals that that cost a lot of money. So we need to figure out the, the battery piece. We ha I think we have a good roadmap to get to that sub $100 kilowatt hour level, which is where we kind of need to be. So cost is on us and then range. So there's a range anxiety, even though most people drive, I don't know, 50 kilometers or so back and forth to the office or the, the work, 
they somehow feel when they get an electric car they need 500 miles of range or 500 kilometers of range. Um, th somehow that doesn't translate when you've got petrol because, you know, um, you could have like, it's in the red on, on your petrol tank, but you'll still go, to, you'll pass by the, the p petrol garage and you'll still go to the office. But, but that's really driven by the fact that everybody knows where the petrol t stations are and so they feel comfortable. Um, so the range anxiety is driven by really charge infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you've got range, which again, we can, f so most of our vehicles now will have 500 kilometers range. And then there'll be different options if you want to buy something which has got less than that. And then the charge speed. So how quickly can I put electricity and recharge the battery? So we're moving we're moving everything to an 800 volt system, which allows us to charge much quicker as well. So we'll f we'll solve the cost issue yep. ourselves. We'll solve the range issue by putting yep. in more batteries effectively or be better technology. And then we'll solve the charge and speed uh, by moving to an 800 volt system. On the stuff that we need help with is infrastructure yeah our jobs as Volvo was not to build infrastructure no. i think government needs to help with that not just the swedish mm, government but all governments around the world it's all very well for governments to say we want to be we want the world to be carbon free and and cop 26 and all that kind of stuff and all you businesses should be doing all this and you're like well okay well we need some help here guys so infrastructure why start mandating that certain amount of car parks and and, and super and then um, shopping malls or start mandating that petrol stations need to rip out their, when they rip out their diesel, they need to put in two or three charge stations. There's a lot that government can do uh, in order to drive that agenda forward. If we really want to take the society to carbon free, mm -hmm. uh, and a big part of that obviously is BEV, um, battery electric vehicle. And then the other two is really people who buy an electric car want to know that the energy is coming from a renewable source. Yeah. They don't want to fill it up with electricity being made from from fossil fuels. Mm. Sweden's great in that respect. 85%, I think, of, of, of electricity comes from uh, uh, renewable yeah, energy. Yeah. But there's other countries around the world where mm. that's not the case. And people say, well, what's the point of buying an electric vehicle if I'm going to fill it up with electricity that's been generated through coal? Mm. Um, so I, I think um, just to, to you know that uh, the Chamber of Commerce will um, assist when it comes to put a pressure on the politicians uh, regarding infrastructure. That is one of our... Yep. Well, that's great. To, I mean, that's great to hear because I think mm -hmm. we, I think we'll solve this collectively. Yeah. Uh, because everybody benefits from this, not least of all our mm -hmm. children and our children's children. Um, but the society in general, it's going to be cleaner air. It's it's actually a better technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, battery electric vehicle is just a better technology. Yep. And so. Mm. Yes, uh, Jim, it has been a pleasure to speak to you. Likewise. Um, from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of, I'm sure, uh, the West Swedish Chambers of the Commerce members, uh, we wish you really, really welcome to Gothenburg and good luck. Thank you very much. Big applause. Yeah.